Then we will start with uh, Amy Schmidt. Uh, Amy is on the faculty at uh, uh, University of Nebraska Lincoln. She has a joint appointment to the Animal Science and Biological Systems Engineering programs at the university. And Amy, uh, I'll leave it for you from there. All right. Well, thank you, Rick. Um, I felt like at the end of the conference they should move us into smaller rooms because it's kind of a big room with not a lot of people in it. But uh, I appreciate you all sticking around. Quality. Yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. Um, so the presentation I'm going to um, cover today is a study that we did a couple of summers ago, maybe three summers ago now, uh, looking at soil invertebrates or um, microarthropods, the little insects in the soil, um, and looking at their response to different swine slurry treatments. And um, the other authors on here, Nicole Schuster, uh, she was a master's student that worked on this project that has since graduated and moved on. Uh, Julie Peterson, she's an entomologist with our um, West Central Research and Extension Center in North Platte, Nebraska. Um, Linda Schott, she wasn't on board when we did the project, but she's helped with getting the publication out the door. Um, and then John Gilley with the USDA ARS in Lincoln, um, a fellow ag engineer there. So um, I know the soil scientists among us hate the word soil health. I appreciate that. I'm still going to use it in the presentation because it's kind of a buzzword that we all hear um, right now around uh, soil quality and improving um, uh, agronomic properties of, of soil. So there's there's a handful of tests that we can have done at um, analytical labs that have been developed over the last several years that are different measures of uh, the biological and, and physical and chemical um, properties of soil. So PLFA is a phospholipid fatty acid test, and this kind of gives just a, a snapshot in time um, status of that soil as far as the community structure of the organisms within it. Um, kind of tells us about the microbial biomass in there, and um, looks gives us an idea of the different functional groups of bugs or, or um, organisms in the soil. The Haney test we're probably all familiar with um, kind of gives us a ratio of organic carbon to organic nitrogen and um, my understanding is most helpful with, with making recommendations related to cover crops and it includes the Solvita uh, CO2 burst test which is a measure of the biological um, carbon dioxide respiration in the soil. So again it's getting back to the organisms that are in there um, that are that are going through respiration and, and a measure of that carbon dioxide um, uh, changes in the soil. So soil arthropods, that's kind of a separate way that we can look at the biological conditions in the soil. So rather than looking at respiration or carbon versus nitrogen in the soil, we're actually looking at the organisms that are present in the soil. Um, we know that all of these microarthropods play an important role in nutrient cycling, breaking down organic matter. Um, they're, they're a food source for larger organisms in the soil. So when we have a lot of microarthropods present, it's kind of a, a, a function of food sources in the soil. And, and the more diverse that population is, um, the more uh, the, the greater the um, diversity of, of activity in that soil and, and um, conditions that are favorable for those organisms. Um, one good thing about arthropods, they don't move around in soil. So, I mean, they move around in their little community, but they're not going long distances. So if we're studying a particular plot or area in a field, what we see there today is what was probably there years ago we're not we're not measuring something that all of a sudden migrated in and, and we're not really getting a good snapshot of what's going on there so that's that's another um, positive aspect of those um, we know that different classes or families of these organisms play different roles have different niche um, responsibility in the soil and so we can look at some of these different um, uh, classes and, and how abundant they are and that gives us a, a bit of feedback on um, uh, the ecology of the soil and, and what's going on in there. Um, and then they provide a way to quickly measure a biological response to, to changes in the soil environment. So if you 
dry out that soil, you're going to see a quick response in, in the number and diversity of those organisms. So uh, probably the drawback of looking at arthropods is it's a lot of counting of little tiny organisms under a microscope. So um, that's why we don't see that a lot as a, a measure of, um, of soil quality. So if we look at the soil food web, I'm sure most everybody has seen this kind of uh, diagram before. When we talk about um, arthropods, we're looking at um, a couple of groups up here. Of course, there's um, you know fungi, bacteria, a lot of other organisms in there, but arthropods play a couple of roles. One is a shredder, so they're, they're breaking down that organic matter in the soil. Um, they also are predators of smaller organisms and their prey. So they kind of are right there in the middle of the food web where um, they, the growth of those feeds the larger organisms and, and kind of um, connects the smaller and the larger organisms together. So what are um, some of their influences? Um, like I said, they break down soil organic matter. They, um, they create food sources for some of the larger soil organisms. They, uh, they're responsible for um, making nutrients more available to the plants. So they break down nutrients, um, making some of those uh, uh, nutrients more accessible to plants. They also um, play a role in forming soil aggregates, so improving the physical characteristics of the soil. And like I said, they provide a food source for some of those higher level um, predators as well. So this is just kind of a breakdown um, taking you back to your soil biology and how we look at phylums and subphylums and, and that. So if we start over here with the, the phylum of arthropoda, um, then we get these subphylums. What we're kind of looking at classifying for more of the order. So the, um, some of these uh, groups, the Acari or mice, the pseudoscorpions, columbula. Um, in particular, we were kind of looking at responses in, in these three. So there's, there's a fair bit of data out there looking at mites and the fact that mites are a good indicator of um, good biological health of soil. The uh, columbula, um, these are springtails is kind of the more common term that you might hear. And, uh, and then those were broken down farther into families. Um, and then pseudoscorpions, these are um, kind of your under a microscope look like little scorpions, so they've got the appendages similar to scorpions. So, um, but so we were classifying kind of all of these different um, orders within within our samples. So like I said, mites, um, springtails, those are a couple of the, the um, uh, types of arthropods that we were really hoping to see a good response in. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is they're some of the most uh, abundant and diverse organisms in the soil. And they, they play that important role in litter decomposition, and nutrient cycling, and soil structure. And uh, like a lot of their um, neighbors of that size, they're, they produce food for other organisms. Uh, just a little bit more on mites. Uh, a lot of different species of them. You find them just about everywhere. Um, they feed on fungi and nematodes. A lot of mites are, we'll see those as um, helping control plant disease, um, root diseases in plants. Um, one of the things we, we understood was that their, their diversity and their abundance um, decreases under significant grazing pressure. We weren't looking at grazing, um, we weren't looking at, at land that had grazing taking place, but um, there's also some, some work being done on a molecular approach to measuring um, the change in mite uh, population in soil, which I think is interesting. That would maybe take away from that act of having to count lots of little tiny, tiny bugs. So um, some of the data out there that kind of led to, to us looking at this project was, um, and we're, we're learning more, I, I, you may have heard uh, Rick Kelsch talk about some of the manure and soil health work that's going on in the north central region and um, really trying to get a handle on the state of the science of how manure impacts soil health and uh, so there's quite a few literature reviews going on um, so there's a lot more data than what i have here but a couple of the studies that we looked at um, we 
you saw the cow, cattle manure when it was applied to soil um, encouraged the columbula population um, and inorganic fertilizers had a negative impact on those. Um, we also saw soil fauna populations improve to a greater extent with um, sheep manure application than um, just when crop residues were returned and there was no additional fertilizer. So we were, um, we were interested in trying to take a closer look at how manure impacted those, um, those organisms in our, our soil plots. So, um, so our main objective was quantifying the impact of swine slurry application um, by method of application um, on the soil arthropod abundance and diversity. So what we did, we had um, plots at a research farm east of Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, this was a silty clay loam soil. It had been um, under no-till management for the, pretty much the history of that farm. There hadn't been any manure application in, to these particular plots in over 40 years. Um, so they were you know, pretty unique soil plots that we had to work with. So what we did, we set up plots, um, four plots under each of our treatments. They were um, 0.75 by two meters. And our treatments were broadcast application of swine slurry, injected application, and then a, a non-manure control. And we, um, we applied that manure on a nitrogen basis um, uh, in June of 2014. So the soil samples that we collect for doing the arthropod analysis, it's kind of, it's about the size of a coffee can. So it's a um, kind of a chunk of soil. You wanna keep it intact so you're not looking at taking several samples that make up that one. Um, kind of a soil core that's 20 centimeters across, 20 centimeters in depth. And, um, and we took that sample on all of our pot, plots prior to application of our manure, um, day one and seven post application, and then monthly for 12 months. So one of the first things you could probably say is you only did this for a year. That's not really long enough to get a long-term understanding of how things are changing, and I completely agree with that. Um, so that's one of the things we recognize is if you really want to see how manure is impacting these um, organisms. We need to extend this for a much longer period of time. Um, anytime the ground was frozen or it was too wet for us to get in the field, we weren't able to collect samples. So, um, so there were a few months that we didn't have samples. Um, but essentially what we did once we collected those, we put them in um, containers that had holes in the lid. We wanted to keep the, the bugs alive. Uh, it doesn't do any good to try to extract them when they're, they're not living. Put those on ice and we drove them over to North Platte, which is three and a half hour drive um, from the research site, got them over there within 12 hours and put them in our uh, Burlesi funnels. And so the, these funnels, um, if you're not familiar with them, they're, you can really build, build them out any way you want. These are made out of PVC, um, and then there's a funnel at the bottom, as you see, and a, a mesh covering or a screen over that. So you put the soil in the top of them. Uh, this right here is, uh, a light source, so you have a light source shining on the top of the soil. As that soil heats up and dries, those, those bugs move down away from that, and as they do, they, they get screened out, they fall through here and into a jar of ethanol and they're preserved. So obviously if they're not alive, they're not moving down through there and, and we're not going to collect them. So, um, And then those jars, um, each time we brought those back to campus so that um, so we could quantify the number of, of um, arthropods in there. So in addition to um, measuring abundance, just purely counting the different types, the different um, orders and families of arthropods, they were also assigned a, what's called an ecomorphological index, and that's a score that's based on a number of characteristics of those insects. So um, it has to do with their, their pigmentation and their number of body segments and um, appendages and things like that. Um, so that, that score kind of is a, a way to um, indicate their degree of adaptability to the soil. So this is the, uh, the table that's used for that EMI score. So like I said, the size of them, their pigmentation, number of legs and length and all that, that good stuff. So, um, so in addition to counting lots and lots and lots of bugs, the student was uh, classifying them, giving them a score based on their characteristics. So, um, in general, overall, 
over 13,000 individual arthropods were um, were found in those samples, and they uh, represented 19 different orders. Uh, most abundant were the Akari or the mites, a um, couple types of columbula, the Isotomidae and the Hypogastridae, and then pseudoscorpions, although they made up a smaller percent, they, they, we did see a pretty decent response in those. So here's our um, breakdown of, of what we found in there by mineral application method. Um, you can see in our, our two types of columbula here in the broadcast treatment, we saw significantly greater um, abundance of those. And this is over the entire uh, length of the study, not, not by, uh, by measure, not by time. Um, we also, in the pseudoscorpions, like I said, not a whole, they didn't make up a, a huge portion of what we found, but, but we did see some, some differences in, and we saw a greater abundance of those under the injection treatment than the broadcast. Mites, there were a lot of them there, but they weren't different among our treatments. So that was a little bit disappointing. We really expected to see a better response there. Um, and then uh, this, this QBS score, which had to do with that ecomorphological index. Again, we didn't see differences among our treatments, although the scores were, were um, you know, fairly high scores. They, they didn't reveal differences. And what this means is there wasn't really a, a difference in biodiversity of those arthropods. There was a lot of them there. There were a few differences among treatments, but overall we didn't see a huge difference in biodiversity under those treatments. We do know that there's a number of things that impact these. So, um, so tillage, land practices, um, that, that has a, probably a little bit greater impact than biological material. So the fact that we were dealing with soil that hadn't had tillage in 40 years, and we went in and injected manure that probably disturbed our soil. So some of the benefits we would have seen from the addition of manure were canceled out by the tillage and the disruption of that soil. Um, so I think the fact that these were long-term no-till plots um, might have been detrimental to, to our results. But um, let's look at, uh, so some of the individual uh, results here, the hypogastridae count, you can kind of see how that changed over time. Um, again, these are part of the columbular uh, family. And so we saw those peak kind of in the middle of our study. I think rather than looking at time since application, it had more to do with um, um, ambient conditions, moisture, soil moisture, temperature, those sorts of things. Um, same with the isotoma day, we saw those peak later in the, in the project, um, about halfway through, could be that what, we didn't have a lot of rain that summer. That was one of our, our kind of bummer deals there is it was a dry summer. So we, I think we lost a lot of the, um, would have seen a lot more changes if we'd had uh, some decent soil moisture because bugs are gonna move down deeper where they can find moisture uh, when the soil's dry. And then the pseudoscorpion, they were kind of opposite of the others where the injection plot had a better um, better response under uh, in the pseudoscorpion counts than the, the broadcast in our control plots. So kind of a summary, um, we were disappointed we didn't see the um, response in mics that we hoped to see. Um, Columbia showed a, the most res significant response, um, broadcast was most beneficial, and uh, specifically those hypogastridae and isotomidae. Uh, pseudoscorpions were affected um, by application method and they, they were affected more by injection or have better response. Um, time following application affected the major factors, but again, this was one year. So if we'd done this over a longer period of time, we might see some different, uh, I'm, I'm sure we'd see some different results. So um, try to wrap up quickly here, I think I'm out of time. Um, the, I think the main point is we saw some interesting results, but this really needs to be a longer term study to really draw any great conclusions from it. And I think if we were looking at soils that um, maybe had been under a tillage um, management practices, and then we stopped the tillage and we kind of looked at how the manure impacts that soil versus um, looking at soils that probably were in pretty good condition because they had been no till for so long, I think we'd probably see better results. But um, on, the, on our first try at doing this, um, I think we kind of had some 
interesting results and more of a learning curve of what to do differently next time. But so I'll wrap up with that. Um, these are some of the folks that spent time collecting samples and counting bugs and doing that not so fun stuff. Um, so with that, I'll take some questions or comments if we have time. Yep, yeah, we have time for a couple questions. Yes, could help. So, <coughs> when, when was the manure application taking place? What is day zero there? So, day zero was the day before manure was applied, and then day, day one would be the day it was applied. Okay, so in, in relation to the timing in the year, what was that? Uh, June, mid to late June is when the manure was applied. So, it went from June of 2014 through June of 2015. So, the peak happened almost about 90 to 120 days. Yeah, so when we got a lot of soil moisture in the fall, yeah. but the soils hadn't cooled down, I think was probably when we were seeing. And when we looked at, you know, um, uh, precipitation data, it was when we had more soil moisture, like I said, it was a dry summer. So I think we, we lost a lot of our um, ability to really see some differences because the soil was dry and nothing was really hanging out there. And the related question to that, then that would be my last one. Is that the normal <coughs> time of peak for those specific? Uh, well, I don't know if you could say there's a normal time for those to peak. They're going to peak when the when the soil conditions are are favorable, which is when there's moisture and and moisture in combination with warm soil. And so, depending on where you're located and what your weather patterns are, I think. Um, One additional question here. Okay. You used uh, data input model, right? I'm sorry? You used data input model in your soil? Type. Soil slurry. Okay, so how was the land application rate? How was the land application? Right, you know, 40,000 meters. Oh, so it was, it was applied on nitrogen need for corn. Uh, for corn. That's how we, we did the application. Okay. Do we have time for Joe or no? Go ahead, Joe. No manure for like 40 years. Okay, and then what was the relative organic matter coming in? Oh, I didn't put that in here. Um, but these these soils, because they've been in no-till for so long, they have, um, they're, I would, I would say, comparatively better than most soils in organic matter, fairly high organic matter in them. I don't remember what the percentage is off the top of that. All right, I think we'll call her quits there. Thank you very much, Amy.